Coming up on Market to Market, the new USDA secretary pays a visit to the Midwest. And snow smothers the wheat belt while heavy rains delay planting. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cobb and Walt Hackney next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, May 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Tech behemoth Apple reported this week having $256.8 billion in cash on hand. The available capital is roughly the value of the 2016 U.S. corn, soy, and wheat crops at today's price twice, and there is still almost enough money to buy nearly every franchise in the National Football League. And with more people working than just a few weeks ago, more iPhones could fly off the shelf. The Labor Department says 211,000 jobs were added last month, and the unemployment rate dipped to 4.4 percent, the lowest in a decade. The U.S. trade balance narrowed in March, the smallest since October. The gap between exports and imports fell to $43.7 billion. The benchmark interest rate will hold steady per the Federal Reserve Board, who predicted the recent slowdown in growth as temporary. Crude oil dipped below $45 this week as OPEC mulls further production cuts amidst worries of a growing glut. And producer sentiment rose again in April's Purdue CME Ag Economy Barometer. The measure of 400 producers was up six points to 130. As rural America seeks positives in the world economy, the new Secretary of Agriculture looks to prove it is always sunny in Nevada. David Miller reports from his town hall in Iowa. Yeah, Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue began his first full week of work loosening the grip of Obama-era lunch program rules by delaying mandatory reductions in sodium levels and holding whole grain requirements at 2014 levels. He capped the week with a trip to Iowa. Calling himself the unapologetic chief salesman for U.S. agriculture, Secretary Perdue met with political and business leaders at the Couser Cattle Company located near Nevada, Iowa. He spoke off the cuff about U.S. agriculture. They wrote me a 17-page speech now. Did y'all rather me do that or talk from my heart, okay? There you go. And what I see when I come to Iowa is family is important, multi-generational family, the love of the land, the love of what we do. Think about what a noble cause it is. Folks, there are a lot of businesses out there today that I don't want to be involved in, but I'm proud to be called an agriculturalist. Think about the nobility of what you do worldwide. We owe it to the consumers of the United States as well as the world to let them know that we are concerned about their safety, the wholesomeness and nutritional capacity of the food they consume. They deserve to know, and we ought to be able to tell them. That USDA stamp is a good housekeeping seal of approval worldwide. And that's what people want. We trust it. And the USDA has built their reputation over trustworthiness. We're trustworthy because we tell the truth. And that's what we want to be known as truth tellers. My father passed away in 1998. He was a lifelong farmer. We were diversified row crop. He unfortunately loved truck farming as well. So I've had my share of watermelons and cantaloupes in my hand, as well as I put my way through college with sweet corn. But, you know, I can still hear his voice ringing. Whether we're renters or owners, we want to leave it better than we found it. And that's what, uh, that's what we want to do from the USDA. That's what we want to do for our land. It's God's bestowment upon us, and we are all stewards. Whether we own this land or whether we rent it, we want to leave it better than we found it. So that's our heart. Thank you. The president understands 
uh, with Gert, the, the, certainly the immigrant farm leader, that uh, these are people that have helped our farmers across the country. He's very concerned about the, getting the criminal, uh, illegal element uh, uh, out of this country, and I support that, support uh, General Kelly at DHS to do that. But we got to be very careful that we don't disrupt a farm labor supply here that's been very integral to agricultural production. The goal of a good leader is to get diversity across there. Geographical diversity is important. Industry-wide, is, the diversity is important. You can't have all corn growers, you can't have all soybean growers, nor cattle or pork or beef. So we want to get diversity there. Not only that, but you've got gender diversity, you've got racial diversity. I want the USDA to look like America and perform. Uh, I, I want it to be the best, most effectively managed and operating agency in the USDA. That starts with good people. Well, to be uh, facts-based, data-driven, customer-focused, with ethics and transparency and integrity, to be the best managed, the most effective, the best value for the American taxpayer and all the United States government. The drought monitor set a diminishing record this week with the smallest portion of the country in drought. The University of Nebraska Lincoln survey dates back to January 2000. As Josh Bittner reports, most of the Corn Belt has more than enough moisture and it came in several forms the past few days. The National Weather Service reported 10 to 20 inches of snow fell within a 40 mile band in northwest and central Kansas last weekend. The blizzard forced officials to close parts of Interstate 70 and most highways in the region. Wheat futures surged to a two-month high as maturing crops sat ravaged under the weight of wet snow. But the rally retreated after dozens of farm analysts fanned out for the state's annual wheat tour and initially found better than expected conditions. On Thursday, the Kansas-based Wheat Quality Council released the tour's results, estimating an average 46.1 bushels per acre for the current crop, contrasted with last year's 48.3. But informal polling of the group and growers resulted in a projected yield of 282 million bushels, down significantly from last year's 467 million bushel harvest. While severe weather has cast a lingering shadow across the state with vague regularity, elements of Kansas' political climate rain down on critics at the conservative Washington, D.C.-based think tank, the Heritage Foundation, who have, in the recent past, called for an end to crop insurance programs. According to the National Association of Wheat Growers, whose president cultivates 4,500 acres of the grain in western Kansas, over 90% of Jayhawk wheat was insured in 2016, with harvest value of around $2 billion. The group pointed out most policies protect against revenue losses rather than yield discrepancies. In response, the Heritage Foundation declared support for payouts in cases of deep yield loss, but said all other risks should be managed by farmers on their own. Several pockets of the Midwest, South, and Northeast dealt with a deluge of heavy rain this week as well. USDA crop figures indicate corn planting progress in neighboring Missouri and nearby Iowa to be significantly lower than this time last year. Show Me State soybeans face a similar situation while thus far soggy conditions in the Hawkeye State have pushed planting percentages for the oil seed down into the single digits for a second consecutive year. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Snow and rain in the wheat belt let the bulls out of the gate in early week trading. For the week, July wheat rallied a dime and the nearby corn contract added four cents. The soy complex navigated a down market Thursday to hold on for a 17 cent gain on the July contract. May meal increased $1.10 per ton. In the softs, July cotton continued its slide with a loss of $1.10 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, May class three milk futures moved up 22 cents. 
The cash cattle market had its largest four-week value increase in market history before a late-week sell-off. The June cattle contract held on for a 4.27 improvement, and August feeders gave back last week's gains with a $1.27 loss. The June lean hog contract rose 2.33. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index fell 37 basis points. Crude oil tumbled $3.02 per barrel. Comex gold retreated 41.40 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index dropped 13 basis points to finish the week at 370.55. Here now to lend us their insight on these and other trends are two of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney. Hi, Mike. Elaine and Walt, welcome, guys. It's an interesting week to be here. It is. But, Elaine, before we get started, I just want to make sure everybody knows you can download our market discussion anytime through our Market Analysis and Market Plus podcasts on our website at iptv.org slash mtom. Yes, a very interesting week. I want to start by looking at the wheat markets. We saw the Chicago wheat, Kansas City wheat, Minneapolis wheat, everybody rallied on that snow concern. Where are we today? We saw it really begin to give some back midweek. Yeah, the weekly performance was double digits, but not not as high as it was uh, uh, on Monday, right? And it definitely was the, when we looked at the commitments of traders reports that came out Friday afternoon, we see that the speculators that had spent weeks and weeks piling in short positions into the wheat market finally got spooked by that snowstorm, and they came back out of it. It was a very classic information cascade, human volatility, lots of behavioral trading going on there. And it wasn't just the speculators. I mean, it, you saw that in the spreads too, that the commercial side of the market, they really wobbled on those spreads in the early part of the week, but then they recovered as they realized that we are, we do still have lots of wheat in this country. Okay. But now let's talk the Kansas wheat in particular. We had the wheat tour out there yeah. this week and uh, we actually had a question on Twitter and I don't know if you know the answer. Were they just looking at standing fields? on the wheat tour? <laughs> I think they, they, they got out there. They got out there into the cold, wet fields. Um, and their estimate was that maybe 20% abandonment. So that's, you know, 1.5 million acres. So maybe 70 million bushels, which is nothing to sneeze at. But, but you know, in the American stocks to use ratio, that's maybe the difference of somewhere over 50% stocks to use ratio, taking it down to slightly less than 50% stocks to use ratio. So we still have a lot of wheat, but that 1.5 million acres that are abandoned, that's where things get interesting and not necessarily just for wheat. The implications of where does the, do those abandoned acres go? I've been saying since fall that I thought there would be a lot of abandoned acres because of the grazing, but now because of the snowstorm or grazing or whatever, it's probably going to go into soybeans. And even if it's not from Kansas, if it's North Dakota or Minnesota where they've had wet, cold conditions and not planting as much spring wheat, I think there's a lot of acres that are going to be going into soybeans from that. But like I said, there's implications in lots of markets from that wheat grazing. Yeah. Uh, Walt, let's talk about that a little bit. All of this wheat that is now down, how many acres did you say? One and a half million? Let's say, yeah. <clears throat> One and a half million acres of wheat that's now potentially fodder for stalker calves. Are guys going to run grass calves on that? I don't know that <clears throat> that will affect the feeder industry as much as <clears throat> some of us thought it might. Okay. Um, there was an issue prior to the snowstorm that occurred all winter long from the day that they started calves going onto the wheat pasture in November and progressively through. And it was the price of wheat <clears throat> discouraged harvesting a lot of those wheat acres. As a result, those producers that had cattle on the wheat elected to forego the harvest and leave the cattle out on the wheat. So in respect then, these down acres that were created by the snowstorm, they may increase some of the pasturage in those areas, particularly in Northwest Kansas, around Hayes and through that country. But primarily, there's still a huge amount of those wheat acres below that that did not get the storm, and they are still retaining cattle on them in a graze-out position. Gotcha. So we will see abandonment, but Elaine, like you mentioned, we're probably going to see a lot anyway, given these prices. Now, did, was that midweek, was that the top of this market? Did we get the weather scare in the wheat market? Um, I, there might still be news. I mean, I think agronomically, you still have to wait to see exactly how much damage there was. But as far yeah. as the response in the market, the, that short covering yeah. burst from the speculators and that price response, that may have been it because 
we still have that much wheat and it still has to compete with corn in a feed market and it still has the same fundamental relationships. Okay. Well, let's talk about the corn market because we do see continued delays as we look at, at rain across much of the corn belt, as we look at snow up in South Dakota and Northwest Iowa and Southern Minnesota. We've got a question here from Glenn in Bryan, Ohio. And uh, Glenn is curious. He wants to know which chapter of your book, Mastering the Grain Markets, covers marketing a crop that's still in the bag. When are we going to get a rally on a late planted crop? That's a well worded question. That's a, that's a good question. And, and I know it's so frustrating to have late planting, but here's the problem is that markets are not very inclined to respond bullishly to wet planting situations. You guys talked about the drought monitor has dramatically improved in the past few weeks. So that means for all of these acres that are being flooded, absolutely, there is flooded acres that are going to have to be replanted and there will be a yield drag in some of those fields. And there are people who are frustrated because they haven't been able to get planted yet and they will probably experience a yield drag individually. But along with all of that, there is all of these other acres that are really happy to have received this extra moisture and will have a yield boost from that. So frankly, the moisture story is probably more bearish than bullish for corn. So where we sit today with guys looking at, at corn they haven't planted yet, with some folks, particularly in the southern half of the Corn Belt, wondering when or if they're going to make that switch to beans or just take preventative plant, how do you handle the marketing in an uncertainty period? Or would you just not be a seller in here at these prices anyway on December corn? Well, I, I just want to point out that it's May 5th and I don't think that we need to worry about switching to bean acres yet. Give it a week or two. Okay. But, but, but yeah, absolutely. That will be a concern because those acres that are flooded, it will take a long time for them to, to wash out. But you know, um, I'm, I'm starting to be concerned if folks don't have things sold. We did get a nice boost here in corn, whether it was just following along with the wheat story. You know, 388, you back up some basis off of that. People can make money here and we do not know that there will be a weather, a weather scare in the summer. And I know Tom was on last week making this exact same point, is that we all have been, been pointing out this summer weather rally, summer weather rally, and we hope for it, but we don't know that it's going to happen. So if you don't have anything sold and you can make money here, I mean, golly, you got to have some risk management. Buying some puts or you selling the futures? Uh, I would either be selling cash or buying puts. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, now let's talk about the soybean market because we do have, as you mentioned, potential increase in acres out of Kansas. We've got a potential increase in acres out of North Dakota as their wheat uh, planting gets further and further delayed. 13 cent bump right. on November wheat or November soybeans. I know. What happened? Uh, you know, I, I have to believe that it's probably just part of that uh, that whole speculative side of the market really pulled back on their trend of short selling. Like, uh, But I think that the shoe might drop. I don't understand, I couldn't explain to you right now today why that extra acreage has not yet been priced into soybeans. So it's either going to drop or maybe something's happening in Argentina that I don't know about. You know, I don't know. I, don't, I can't explain that. And so it makes me nervous and it makes me want to sell. Okay. So it makes you want to sell. Here's the other question we've got for you. On this weather scare, this snowstorm that went through Kansas and all the rains and so forth, we saw the markets respond. We saw old crop respond much more quickly and much more uh, aggressively than new crop, which should have presumably been the crop affected. Why was that? What aspect of market psychology caused that? Well, it's market mechanics because the, the nearby contracts are where those speculators are. All those speculators that were in there with their short bearish positions, they get spooked by those headlines. So they come out and, and where they're coming out of is those nearby contracts. Okay. And after this week in the Commitment of Traders report, has that net short position across the commodities are they about flat now? No, no, no. They still have would have a lot of short covering to do. They're, they're okay. still net short, but there was just a, a good chunk of short covering did occur early in this week. Very, I mean, before Tuesday. We don't know how much of it may have occurred in the, the tail rest end of, of the week. last yeah. week. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, Elaine, want to take a chance to talk about the cotton market. Still up mid 70s, north of the mid 70s. Yeah. Dropped a buck ten this week. Are we just taking some of that risk premium out of this market? Well, you know, I. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to be selling new crop cotton because, again, of you looking at that drought monitor and the good conditions that people might expect. Now, people might have had an 80 cent target and the nearby contracts did hit that, but the December contract did not. But I, I don't think you should be sitting here waiting for 80 cents in the December contract based on all of the nervousness from the crude oil coming down because China demand might be, just, you know, wobbling. Let's, I'm nervous about that. Nervous. <clears throat> You're inclined to just take, hey, where we're at today. Yeah, it seems to be plateauing, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, now, 
We've got time, Mr. Hackney. We need to discuss this cattle market. It has been a roller coaster for the past three weeks, but the last week and a half in particular. And we've got a question here, I think, to start us off from Brian in Southeast Iowa. Brian's on Twitter at Bayless Beef Cattlemen down in uh, Southeast Iowa. He wants to know at what point do we lose consumer beef demand to cheaper pork? When do the buyers at the grocery counter start to move away? I believe that we had the opportunity to lose our consumer demand on beef because of cheap pork and poultry um, a year and two years ago. I think it's behind us. Okay. I think the consumer is geared for luxury cuts of beef as we speak. I think you've seen the effect of that interest in consumer acceptance the last two weeks exactly and maybe three. Every evening we were two and three dollars a hundred weight up in the beef choice cutout, which is your primals primarily. And the, the um, opportunity for the consumer is not economics right now in regard to food stuff. It's the quality of their diet and they want good choice beef in their diet right now. You know, that being said, we had a grocery store in, in my little community that was selling ribeyes for eight forty nine dollars a piece, eight ounce ribeyes. What is that? 16 bucks a pound? Yeah. Yeah. That's some, that's some decent price. How long can those kind of prices support cash trade in the 140s? Can we continue to push this thing higher, Walt? <clears throat> if, we're, if we're suggesting that we're going to retain 140 in the cash market, then we're going to have to monitor the usage in the retail sector very closely, and we're gonna to have to look at the tonnage going to the retail sector. That's one of the pluses we've had for several weeks in the beef industry, is the weight of the cattle coming out of the feedlots have been very nominal. Mm -hmm. It's been very useful. It has not been any kind of a fed low overload, if right. you will. The beef weight has been a real plus because of the consumer demand. They've used it very quickly as it's hit the retail. I find no reason to see anything changing in that unless we have a market similar to we've had yesterday and today. Okay. Now, if we have a market similar to yesterday and today, then finally psychology is going to start dictating the trend, not actuality of the usage of the product. And we'll have to see. Uh, it was debatable and it was predicted by certain entities in the industry that <clears throat> we would have a turnaround in this economical blow up, if you will, an explosion, if you will, historic raises in the beef, if you will. And there's been those that have weathered many storms in that regard have said, wait and see. Right. And by waiting and seeing, it started Monday of this week. And you notice June, if you did, went up, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yep. That makes that theory wrong. Yep. Except on the same day, December went down. Yes. And when December went down, that was a trigger to some of our industry analysts that there's something haywire, there's a skunk in the wood pile here somewhere. The skunk is the prod exactly what you and Elaine have been discussing in this wheat industry. That's the issue. The issue is graze out cattle that should have and historically are out of the wheat pasture March 10th to 15th. Now they're still there. And today as we speak, they're still standing there. Now Mark, or uh, Mike, that isn't, that is not a reason for a calamity, except when you project those cattle coming off of the graze out wheat weighing 
9 to 1,000 instead of 8 to 850, that steer coming out in December and uh, November, instead of weighing 13, is going to weigh 15. We talked tonnage was driving yep. this cash market. It is. It'll also drive it down the hill as well as up the hill. All right. Now, there's a huge discussion we can have on feeder cattle as well. Do you see that quickly just going to chase live cattle higher, or are we going to see a steeper break in the feeder cattle given they were limit down the past Thursday and Friday? Well, I think the feeder cattle movement in the mercantile was almost a direct relation to the conversation that you and Elaine had about this graze out issue. Okay. And, and I have contacts who deal in huge numbers of feeder cattle in the Southwest off of wheat pasture indicating this month to the 15th of June, <clears throat> which is very late in usual marketing yeah. periods for wheat pasture cattle, this year they're going to have record numbers because of the cattle moving off of the wheat. But the worst thing is, instead of a weighing eight, eight and a half, which is usual, they're going to be weighing nine to a thousand. And in that regard, they're going to have record numbers. They're going to have record placements of that weight cattle going to the feedlots. And as a result, in December, you're going to have big beef. All right. Well, Walt Hackney and Elaine Cub, thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us this week. It's an interesting week. It has been. And we will talk lean hogs in the market plus portion of our program, which you can find on our website. And Elaine and I will also, and Walt and I, will also keep the conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which you can find in podcast and video form right there on our website. While you're there, check out the link to our Instagram page where we post photos from our journeys across America and behind the scenes adventures. Find us at IPTV Market. And join us again next week when we explore how one farming community is cleaning up their water supply. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.